Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Esther Aguilera, President and CEO of the Latino Corporate Directors Association. Welcome to the LCDA virtual board leaders convening. We're calling this our convening reimagined. Our theme is leading at a time of crisis and recovery. And as we all experienced when the pandemic hit, we pivoted uh, our normally what was an in-person event to a virtual event, but we decided to, uh, rather than host uh, a couple of different days of panels, our sessions um, are being hosted. We kicked it off in June and hosting sessions through the end of November and potentially uh, beyond that. And the reason for it is because what we're experiencing Experiencing is not only unprecedented, but I think the stages of what we can discuss and report on continues to evolve. So in general, you know, board leadership has been put to the test in these, this time of tremendous uncertainty and high stakes re realignment. And so with us today on, on our panel, the the title is Leadership Matters, the intersection of insurance and the pandemic. Uh, before we introduce the panelists, I would like to just remind everyone to um, put yourself on mute unless you're called on to ask a question. We encourage you to send your questions in the chat feature. Uh, don't hesitate, uh, you know, post your question whenever you have it and uh, we will monitor that um, there will be time for Q&A. Um, but it is, um, what we're living through today is certainly, we've said is a, not only unprecedented, but um, in the US, uh, besides the pandemic, we have uh, an, an economic crisis that's been driven by a simultaneous lockdown in every part of, of the facet of business. Um, it's challenging businesses and economies alike. And how uh, can a business respond to these challenges and become more resilient in the future? That is one of the themes for today's session. So the session uh, we have LCDA member and Marsh McLennan Vice Chair, Julio Porto Latin, who is speaking with the company's president and CEO, Dan Glacier. Again, uh, Dan, to you and Marsh and McLennan companies, welcome and thank you for being part of the LCDA virtual convening. I hand it over to you, Julio. Thank you, Estet, and this is uh, quite a honor and privilege to have the opportunity to speak to LCDA members and others as we join in talking about the intersection of insurance and the world of pandemic that we currently find ourselves in. But in addition to that, I am just so happy and pleased to be able to have this conversation with Dan Glazer, who is a friend of mine, as well as being an esteemed colleague for many years. And we, we spent a lot of time together going through a lot of different circumstances that we had to face up to and come out the other side. So hopefully we can add some of that perspective as we talk about the different aspects of what's going on in the world today, because we will get into things like also purposeful leadership. We'll get into empathy and the importance of it as we lead uh, people to uh, new journeys ahead. And, uh, and, and, and also you know, providing that safe place for our colleagues as they look for opportunities to be able to continue their careers and aspire to do great things in the future. So we're gonna, it's gonna run the gamut a bit. Um, Dan and I will have a little bit of conversational discussion more than Q and A we hope. Uh, but to start things off, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dan and I go back quite some ways and he has a quite an interesting background. And I think uh, everyone can benefit from him sharing some of that. It included starting off with Marsh many years ago and going overseas for an assignment that obviously had some risk associated with it, but he took it. And then coming back and doing other work on the carrier side, and then coming back to Marsh and a lot in between. So maybe we can hear from him both on his professional progression, 
as well as some of his uh, personal attributes around his family so we get to know him a little bit. So Dan, over to you. Okay. Well, I mean, the one thing I could tell you about my career journey, Julio, is it's, uh, it's been a long one. <laughs> it's almost 40 years and I, I think back at it, you really lead, lead different lives. I mean, you, you go through iterations and you've got to keep kind of developing and growing as, as a human being before you can grow as, a, as an executive. And, you know, I, I look at it as that every career is a snowflake. Um, if I made similar decisions um, I don't know if there'd be similar outcomes. You know, everything is just, you know, I never set out to be a CEO. You know, that was not in my mind. What I wanted to be was a contributor. I wanted to have a, an important job. I didn't know what it was, but, you know, ultimately it's like be on the team and contribute as much as you can. And the one that thing that you can give is everything you've got, you know? So I've never been the smartest guy in the world. I've never been the person who's going to invent the moonshot for a company, but, but ultimately, you know, I've been grinding it out for almost 40 years. And the one thing I can do is, is give it my all. And, and that is something that, you know, I, I always wanted to do. You mentioned that I took some risks. Um, they didn't appear that way to me at the time, but, you know, I, I did volunteer to go to Saudi Arabia when I was 24 years of age. You know, a lot of people probably wouldn't do that. I was young and single and I was going to a place where everything that a young single person could possibly want to do um, was basically illegal and so uh, <laughs> but 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 a, a lot happened I mean I in, in some ways I, I always even though I never thought about becoming a CEO someday I always had ownership instincts even when I was very young like I would see things and I would sort of agitate for change within the company. And I think that's vitally important in every organization, but particularly people who work for a large organization, you know, you want, the, I, you want people pushing against the machine. You want people who are basically saying, why do we do it that way? You know, if we do it this way, we might save a bit of money or we might please our clients more, or it may be a better place to work. And so the constant level of agitation and the way I look at it now, that's what I'm still doing. I'm still agitating. I'm still sort of pushing against the natural complacency and inertia that successful organizations find themselves in. And so I'm often on the side of people who are creating challenge within the organization. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, I, uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Dan is an adopted member of the Latino community because he, he is the father of three Latinas, having uh, their mother being from Latina background. Right, Dan? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> my, my middle daughter, you know, blonde as can be, and she always says, uh, you know, I might be white on the outside, but I'm absolutely Latina and Puerto Rican on the inside. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's true. I can tell you it's true. Um, yeah. You know, and so I, it, it, it's been an enriching part of my life you know, to, to have a, an experience where you're basically in multiple cultures at the same time. Um, I, I found just, just a, a way that uh, made me very comfortable. I knew there was a reason why you and I connected so early in our in our friendship. So, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we, we used to always say that. Yeah, you know, I was I was surprised when you introduced me as a friend because you you've always been <laughs> brothers. Yeah, that's right, brothers we are and always will be. Um, let me let me uh, let me uh, also talk a little bit about uh, since we do have board members and also aspiring board members as part of the audience today. It might be helpful for you to give some perspective about your, the evolutionary journey in terms of your relationship between you as a CEO of a Fortune 200 company, uh, 17 billion revenue, last check somewhere around 58 billion market cap. I mean, very impressive organization. Um, but between you as a CEO of that organization and the board, the importance of that relationship and that journey. Yeah, no, I, I, if, I think, first of all, CEOs, and boards themselves have to be really honest with themselves and say, is this a good board? 
Do we have a good board? Do we have the right people, the right voices around the table? Um, I, I'm very lucky because the Marshall McLennan board is, is very strong, you know, very highly qualified individuals from a variety of backgrounds. And, you know, we've done well for a while, but they've been through some crises as well. And so it, it's a board that has the, um, I think the right balance between challenge and support. You know, speaking as a CEO, you don't necessarily want a board that is just constantly in your face, right? Just always challenging, never satisfied, always wanting more. That, but some of that has to occur. There has to be challenge. There has to be pushback. There has to be good, detailed questioning of, of a wide range of issues, everything from strategy to performance to systems and governance and all of that. But at some point you have to say, okay, am I supported? Do I feel supported by the board or do I feel like they're on the other side of the table and that it's just a, you know, it, it's just a, a battle. And I feel very supported. I feel challenged as well. I mean, I come out of uh, our, you know, in, in the pre COVID world, we were six meetings a year, day and a half each. And I come out exhausted. Oftentimes I'll take, uh, a soft day the day after a board meeting, not a lot of meetings. I just have to recharge, you know? And so um, I think in terms of relationship, I don't have a, a different story between what I would say to any colleague who works at Marshall McLennan, any senior person at Marshall McLennan, any investor of Marshall McLennan or any board member of Marshall McLennan. I'm not trying to spin things or put it in a way where, where, you know, I have to say, okay, I'm speaking to this individual or this group now. And so therefore my messaging has to be different. I, I, I basically am an open book. It's transparent. I talk about what's working, what's not working, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that openness and transparency has helped build trust. Now, I don't do, I didn't do it with the objective of building trust with the board. I did it because I couldn't do it any other way. You know, it's just the way I am as a human being. I'd rather debate it out. I'd rather talk it out. And so if anything, I'm more likely to bring up issues that I think some people wouldn't bring up because they, they are possible issues. They're not issues right now. I'll bring them up. I'll, like I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, the other thing I'd like to say about boards today, which I think is quite different than 20 years ago. It's hard work. I mean, there's no, it's no honorific. I mean, these are super successful people. And the, the reality is, you know, the pre-reads, our typical pre-read is 500 pages. I mean, and it is a lot of heavy slop, you know, of not just, you know, I, I've got a much easier job. I get a lot of presentations where where I can hit the high notes. You know, the board really has to dig in, particularly in the committees, to understand the issues at a level of depth that, um, that can make them an expert. And so, you know, it, it, it's, uh, a, lot has, a lot has evolved over a number of years. And, you know, uh, somebody shouldn't be on, the bo on a board if, if they're not recognizing that it's, it's a real job. It's, it's not just show up and, and listen and, and interject the odd point. You got to dig in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. I mean, I've seen it from the from your perspective as you came out of those meetings and you mentioned that it was uh, time to decompress a bit. I know that you and I used to have, always have that time in the afternoon of the second yeah. day when you're just ready to kind of transition into decompressing. We get we go into a little exercise where you give me a little bit of a feel of what went on and then. And then I hopefully give you a little bit of a lift so that you can then decompress for the next day. But these things are happening. We're human beings, right? At the end of the day, it's high intensity for a couple of days. And you're right, board members are also in, uh, hopefully as focused in the, in, because they have, to, they have to give themselves to those meetings. You can't any longer show up at a board meeting and think that it's all about just being present physically. It no longer is just about being present physically. You've got to be all in. I mean, you really do. And if you don't, 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 don't be a board member. I'll tell you a little funny story. When, when I first became the CEO, it was probably my second meeting. Or, um, you know, the, I was getting so much advice during this one particular board meeting. Uh, I even forgot what the issue was, but 
you know, it was like, you, you have 12 people around a table and there was a lot of interaction and it, and the, frankly, some of the advice was directly contradictory to what I just heard from this side of the table. Now we've got another position, now we've got another position. And so I said, okay, 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 listen, let me tell you why I don't golf. Because when I went golfing with three people who knew how to golf, one person was saying, keep your arms straight. One person was saying, keep your butt higher. Don't bend your knees. You know, don't move your head. Like, let me just hit the ball. So I said, <laughs> let me just hit a couple of balls out here. And then, we'll, and then we can circle back and, and critique it. But, but it can't be in, in the now. It has to be, you know, um, the CEO has got to be allowed to have the freedom to do the job as well without, you know, w- without a lot of, management. So our board has done a great job of, of trend, re- really looking over the course of many, many years of going from something which, which was not focused as much on oversight, governance, strategy, and was too involved in um, financial matters, budget, performance, because the company was not doing well for quite a long time, that we've gone away from that. And we spent literally very little time in, in um, discussing the numbers, we're, uh, we're yeah. on different Right. I'm gonna pivot uh, a little bit, uh, Dan, if it's okay with you, over to the preparedness, insurance, pandemic. But before I do that, I know there's something that you speak about very passionately, which I think would be a nice pivot uh, to going into that topic. And that is the area around the three C's and the importance of being able to pay the proper attention as necessary to be able to manage those three C's, especially during current times. Maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into that, please. Sure, sure, sure. So the three C's that Julio is referring to is things that I think that a lot of C-suites believe are their biggest risks. And they're different, they're very different. Cyber, culture, and climate. So you, you look at that and I, I know I had sort of an epiphany in that you know we, we go through our uh, risk evaluation a couple of times a year in depth as an executive committee is a particular type of risk I always thought was our biggest risk. And after sometime in, in late March, it just hit me. I'm like, no, our biggest risk right now is cyber. Like cyber may have been a number two, three, four, five risk. Now it's number one. And I think for most large multinational organizations, our biggest risk. I mean, where what would we be like in this remote environment if we couldn't communicate each other with each other? If if I came into, you know, turn on my laptop and I'm looking at a blank screen and my and the whole company was in a similar position, it would be a horrible situation. So if anything, now is the time for board members to create more challenge around cybersecurity issues, systems and controls. You know, is, it, is the company far along enough in identifying their crown jewels, building the right perimeter, um, having multi-factor authentication, having encryption of, of data, not only at, ri- at rest, but data on the move as well. I mean, there's a, a lot of good hygiene. And I think now more than ever, you know, cyber is a, a huge is- issue and will be with us for a while. Um, you know, sometime in our lifetime, almost certainly, there will be a cyber hurricane that is um, unforeseen at this moment in, in intensity. And so, which would impact a lot of companies and a lot of countries at the exact same moment. So um, then of course, culture, I mean, culture, culture is revealed in times of crisis. So all CEOs and most boards probably start from the position of saying, yeah, the culture at the company is really good. You know, there's very few companies that, that say we've got some issues with our culture that we've, we've got to get underneath. Cultural work is very hard, you know, to, to deliver. Um, and so I, I think it's not only more acute during COVID, but it's more acute based upon advances in technology. The use of artificial intelligence, robotics, um, et cetera, is going to have a tremendous impact on companies' culture, the workplace, you know, working 
whether you're working remotely and whether you go back to more of a hybrid model. I mean, there's huge implications to culture. So I think that's a, a big concern for, for boards around the world and C-suites. And the last one I would say is climate. You know, human beings are really good at dealing with something that's right now and urgent. Much harder to get your mind around something that might be 20 years out, 50 years out, 100 years out. Um, it's hard to do. And yet, when you look at where the investment dollars go, where big offices are, where people want to live, are generally on coasts. They're generally on, in, in, on waterways. And, and that can be really significantly impacted. We've already begun to see more extreme weather events and, and different types of weather events. Sure, we've always had hurricanes and we've always had intense hurricanes. But, you know, there is a growing body of scientific belief that more water in the atmosphere through climate change is creating slower hurricanes. You know, so forget about the intensity for a second, just dramatic levels of rainfall moving slowly, you know, and that, and that, that is really problematic as well. And of course the wildfire situations. I mean, we're, we're, going, we're having extreme weather events manifest um, and climate is going to be a long, difficult road. Um, you know, and, and humans are going to learn how to grapple with it. Thanks, Dan. And, and, and when we now pivot a little bit more towards the pandemic uh, and insurance response to the pandemic, well, first, uh, you know, the insurance industry is very well known for obviously being incredibly essential for just about everything that happens in society it has an implication of some sort in the insurance world and in risk taking and the ability for companies to see risk differently if there's some protection along the line. So, uh, but as you think about that, it also serves a purpose, the insurance industry, of assessing current and future risks and somehow being kind of in front of them of the risk as they develop so that they can develop solutions along with their clients and be prepared. The, qu the question that is being asked is how prepared were we as an industry for the type of experience that we're now seeing through the pandemic? What risks did we foresee when what options were available to address those risks? And how do you see that as it continues to develop in the future? Yeah. I, I don't think we can be too hard on the industry. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the reality is it's a noble industry. Um, insurance gives you the freedom from the emotional and financial burdens of loss. But, it, but as you mentioned, it, it, it's not just about protection. Insurance also provides freedom for the mm -hmm. take risk and the creation of value and um, innovation, you know, nothing really happens. Part of the DNA of capitalism, you know, and so many of us wouldn't leave our homes if we weren't protected. Would you literally go and uh, use your car if you didn't have something like insurance? So I, I wouldn't be too hard on the industry. I, what, what, I, what I do believe is that um, there were two unforeseen events. Now the pandemic should, should not have been that unforeseen. Pandemics are not that uncommon. I mean, you just think in the last 30 years or so, we've had SARS, we've had H1N1, now we have COVID, uh, we have you know bad flu season sometimes. I mean, pandemics are, are really not that uncommon. Uh, the globalization and the increased travel and the increased trade that exists between nations probably uh, makes pandemic flares and the transmission, almost instantaneous transmission around the world, um, pretty unique and different, you know, now than, than 100 years ago, as an example. Um, I think, I think the, the big factor was not necessarily the pandemic, it was the global response to the pandemic. And, you know, I don't want to get too ideal, ideological or anything. I mean, there's different views as to whether global lockdowns make sense or not. It's the first time there's ever been a global lockdown to my knowledge. It's certainly the first time there's been a response like that to a pandemic. Um, and I remember hearing an economist say to me 
that uh, you know, you know a, a, a cat can't kill an elephant, but a cat can scare an elephant and make it run off a cliff. And in some ways, some of the impact of the global lockdown that will be lasting, not only on economic outcomes, but health outcomes. I mean, there's less cancer screening. There's less people getting, children getting vaccinated. There's less prevention happening. And that's all gonna manifest over years. The increase in poverty around the world is in the hundreds of millions of people, all as a result of, of the global lockdown. So, it, and it's one of those things, part of, part of this is the fact that human beings have become very adverse to risk. We just don't like it. And so governments who we elect um, are very tuned into that. And so once you go down a path where good behavior seems to be like keep everyone at home, well then, then if you were a government who said something different to that, you'd be pilloried as being almost like uh, a Neanderthal. And so everybody said, no, this is what you have to do. Everybody has to you know, get back into your house and stay there. Not exactly, I mean, I, I was reading The Splendid and the Vile, a book uh, by Eric Larson on, on Churchill. I mean, people during the Blitz, which lasted for a year, went to work every day. Like basically, you know, the Blitz happened every night. Thousands of people died almost every day. And people picked themselves up through the rubble, the rubble and trudged themselves to work the next morning to recognize that by evening they were going to be bombed again, you know? And so, so I just wonder, but I, I do think that the global lockdown is the issue and that makes it impossible for insurance companies. Insurance companies might in some way be able to cover some element of pandemic risk on a targeted basis. In fact, some companies have that kind of coverage, uh, but no insurance company has the capital to cover government mandated economic shutdown. You just can't do it, it's too big. In the US economy alone, they're saying it's about a trillion dollars. You know, well, okay, there's no insurance company in the world that can expose themselves that way. So I would say pandemics may be able, in future pandemics, there may be a way to provide limited targeted coverage, something like, okay, maybe you can cover your fixed cost, 50% of your fixed cost for three months or something like that. Um, but, but there's no ability to, to say, and that coverage is going to be available to you if the government mandates that you close your door. You, you mentioned earlier some of the risks associated with pandemics that, and that there's a certain element of rhythm to them as well, which I don't think a lot of people really take a step back and, and, and kind of recognize that there is a rhythm, there is a frequency to these things. We tend to compare the current pandemic to what happened 100 years ago, uh, but the reality is that these things are happening with some degree of frequency Yes. And mostly, and mostly tied to global, you know, connectiveness that we have now. That you know, it's not going to change. Uh, in any event, what's uh, I, I, the solution to all of this is 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 important to perhaps bring some attention to, because as you mentioned, there aren't many financial institutions. In fact, there are none that can really provide the backstop that's necessary, even through insurance, primary, and reinsurance to be able to have a comfortable private solution. So is there something that we're, we should be advocating for, that Mars should be advocating for as we go forward in a kind of a public private partnership? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you nailed it. It has to be governments and the private sector working hand in glove to find a solution. And, and we did it in, in, uh, in terrorism insurance, right? And we, a program was created that has been very successful in the United States and it exists in some other countries as well. And this is a very different obviously, but generally in the same vein, you can't expect the private sector to take on infinite levels of risk. They don't have the capital for it. These risks, by the way, exist right now and are with the government right now. I mean, that, that, that is the truth. Now the private sector can do a good job of 
helping by either uh, putting some skin in the game, using the, the vast capability of the administrative systems of insurance companies to pay claims and administer as an example, but also suggestions about mitigating losses and looking at ways to improve risk management is something that the private sector can do much more effectively. So, so to me, the best outcome would be some basis to where the insurance industry, and let's just talk about the United States for a second, but the insurance industry and the US government act in concert to utilize the skills of the private sector to uh, help mitigate loss and help administer losses. Um, have the private sector have some skin in the game on some basis, and then have the backstop, financial backstop, be the federal government. And I think that kind of discussion, those discussions are happening right now. Um, and I do think it's, it's, it's vitally important because it's one thing to not have the level of resilience we want in this pandemic, but if we don't do the, the necessary things now, well, the next pandemic, we, we won't be resilient either. And we should create more resilience and more certainty around what the government and private sector response would be in the next pandemic. Yeah, there's, um, there's been a, a, a lot of different types of approaches by CEOs colleagues of yours across the Fortune 500, FTSE 1000, et cetera, in the way they're seeing and, and, and addressing some of the uh, social injustice that we see uh, happening in the, uh, in, the, in the streets. And what I, I want to declare right here that early on, Marsh McLennan took a very strong step to establish, you know, obviously a fund to help employees who were finding themselves in financial straits because of the pandemic. And then in addition to that, early on, you as a CEO came out very forcefully with clear intentions on how we were gonna move the organization forward. Some of the things that you have learned as a leader, which I think is fantastic to be able to, uh, to, to talk to people about, and ultimately, you know, what and how we should be addressing some of the things that are happening. I wanted to give you the opportunity because you have a great voice in this area and I think everyone would really benefit from it. Well, thank you, Julio, and, I, and I'll say openly, you're, you're one of the people who helped educate me over years, not, not over weeks or months, and not because of COVID, but, but you were a clear uh, voice and advocate for more diversity in the firm. Um, you, literally, you, you walked the talk in how you led Mercer, and you know, clearly the level of diversity on the executive committee in Mercer and through the ranks is quite high. And performance was quite good, uh, and, and it, you know I, I think it's very much linked. And so I, I thank you for for helping me um, learn o over a period of, of really many years. Um, you know, the first thing I think I, I think as I, I wanted to do, and um, when we were first you know addressing this, is to acknowledge that racial inequality. And racism in general, both on a race and ethnicity basis, um, is real, you know. And whether and it's not just justice. Yes, it's 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 justice in terms of um, policing, but it's also about healthcare and education. And this became apparent and exposed in during COVID, right? Would would, would all of us have known George Floyd's name? There's been many George Floyds over many, many years, way too long. I mean, the, the murder of George Floyd was a shock to many people and all too familiar to others. And so I think the fact that we were all at home on our screen and this was brought right to us, you know, what, what created a, a, uh, a shock value that I hope society benefits from and, and takes from here. Um, but you just look across the, uh, the spectrum. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, America owes a debt to people who kept working. And I'm talking about people stocking grocery shelves, driving delivery trucks and trucks in general, moving the material, working in the pharmacy, working on 
as a frontline worker, whether that's EMS or healthcare or other factors. I mean, and, and a lot of that, frankly, um, is brown America. And a lot of that is dreamers, you know? So I, I, I absolutely believe that our entire society is in debt and has an obligation to, to address some of these inequities. And, um, and I hope we seize the moment. You know, I, I certainly believe that uh, for Marshall McLennan, um, this is a, a significant issue that will not leave the executive committee table um, for the rest of my career. You know, because this is the long haul of improvement, not some element of tokenism. It's actually, how do you underpin and make us a more diverse organization? And frankly, diversity is not only the right thing to do, but it, it actually arrives at better client outcomes and better colleague engagement. So what the hell is standing in the way? And those kind of issues that come up, you got to find a way to blast through them, right? And so um, when, I, when I look at it, Part of it really was communicating openly. And a big part of this was, is about listening, not having all the answers, but actually creating groups of people you can talk to, listen, and help um, people in the know formulate the strategy and the execution plans and the recommendations, as opposed to just coming up with a few things that look more like window dressing. And so, you know, we've created a race council We've got 12 people on that race council. They will, they will meet with me regularly and with the executive committee quarterly. Um, and, you know, and we want things to happen, right? So it's basically, okay, what should we do? Here's a list of 20 potential things, which are, I want you guys to debate what path to take, you know, because and one of the things I learned very early, it's not just about hiring more people. Because it, it really, that, that's like treating people who don't work for you better than the people who work for you. So it's got to be a combination of increased hiring while increasing levels of uh, high quality assignments, promotion opportunities, um, career development opportunities for, for minority people who currently work at the organization. You know? and so this is, uh, I, I also think a big part of this is making a stand for pay equity, not just on gender, but on all kinds of racial and ethnic di dimensions. And we've got the data. So, you know, we're, 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 we certainly are committed to, to doing that. Um, and we came out very quickly just because of uh, wanting to, to make a statement of how real it was for us and said that we were going to donate $5 million in the coming couple of years to organizations outside the firm that are dedicated to some element of social or racial justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, first thing, I'll tell you in front of the whole crowd, I am incredibly proud of you uh, for taking the stance that you've taken for leading the charge when many others are still trying to figure out how to do it um, and, and recognizing that is that not everything's gonna go right as you go through this journey. And it's not something where the formula is so well written that you can have an outcome that is so predictable. I mean, it is certainly, but if your heart's in the right place and you see it as being a sustainable business advantage for the organization to have that type of diversity in, in all layers so that it contributes to more innovation, more insight, better decisions, et cetera, I think it has some sustainability to it. So I, I, I applaud you as, you as you go through this journey. Thank you, I appreciate it. I and thank you for, for recognizing some of the influence I might've had in that thinking. But when everything is said and done, you have to have a receiver of a message or else it doesn't work. So, yeah. so I appreciate the listening. Um, when, when, when everything is said and done, Marsha McLennan is part of a very large set of businesses that are incredibly important to the world that we live in. It's around, you know, of course, the people, the strategy and the risk of every element of society. And we interact and engage in all those elements. One of, yeah. the, one of those elements, of course, is the people side. And having had the privilege and honor of being the global CEO of that people business, which is MRSA, um, there's no question that the implications 
of what's happened, especially most recently, is going to be seen a lot around the people, the implications of jobs in the future, the implications of work environments and how we engage. Um, how, how is Mercer thinking about these things and how is it putting itself in a position to be able to be a partner with companies in the future as they deal with these people issues that obviously have been accelerating? I mean, it's a great question. And, and obviously companies of every size uh, have to grapple with, with this issue. And you know, part of it is um, a returning to a more normal environment of what's being called the new normal. That, that, that's part of it. But, but, but a lot of companies are, are trying to say, how can we actually be better? How can we build better? And so that's, um, uh, that's something that Mercer is very much focused on. And I think it's in stages. You know, first stage is really returning safely. How do we operate in a safe environment? How do we feel, how do we make the colleagues that work at a firm believe that, that they, can, they can do their job um, in an office and they can do it safely? And so there's a lot of work that's been done around that. Then I think it's returning to more of a stability. Uh, it's something that, that's more foundational. So it's, always, it's not only safe, but it's recognizing the value that, that can get created from working in an office environment. And, and that enables the return to a more energized environment. So a return to energy. And so I think a lot of companies are going to be more flexible organizations than they've been in the past. And when I say more flexible, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to be able to work from home all the time. It means that, that you know, people are going to have more personal choice. It won't be that there has to be something that's written down that says, you know, I don't work on in the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I work from home on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think it'll be more natural that somebody is talking to somebody on Tuesday and said, I decide to work from home today. And that'll be viewed as, as completely normal behavior. Um, I also think the level of trust in some ways that exists, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, I've got to trust in my people, my colleagues to work hard serving clients, period, and to do their jobs. There's no checking mechanism and I don't want the checking mechanism. I don't want the technology that can say how many hours are they, you know, how many clicks are they doing a day? I mean, that's all to me, big brotherism. But, but still, there's a high degree of trust that people are doing the right thing. So I don't want to trust people less when we return to the office than when they're working from home. You know? And so, so on that basis, I think in some ways, the higher the degree of trust between uh, the people who work at an organization that it's all their company and they're giving it their all, that higher degree of trust means you can have a very thin rule book. And so people are expected to be treated like adults and they're expected to do the right thing. And so, you know, I think a lot of it will be, Mercer has been advising a lot of companies how to create more of a hybrid model. Think of the office almost like the library when you were at university. You didn't go to the library. Well, Julio, you probably did go to the library every day. I didn't go to the library. <laughs> but it was there and I went certainly several times a week and there were certain times of the semester where I was there every day and some of those days, hours and hours and hours. So it's like peak and non-peak. And it's the same thing that an office might be. An office might be there for you to come in, collaborate, work on teams, um, work through peak client deliverable assignments to where you have to work a lot of hours in the office and you need that environment. But then on other times, which are less peak, Maybe you don't commute that day or that week. You, you work from home, so more of a hybrid model. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan. Um, I'll give a quick shout out, although we don't have a time to talk about it in deep detail, for Scott and Oliver Wyman, who I think have come up with some really good tools to help clients assess risk as it relates to the pandemic. And the Pandemic Navigator, of course, is a tool to do just that, to help in understanding and forecasting into the future, uh, the impacts and on your business. And... So I give them a shout out and 
and of course, give hopefully opportunity for others to inquire about that because it really is worth uh, having some conversation about. Last question before we get into some Q and A, and we got a, we got a ton of Q and A, so I think we have to spend some time on them. I feel obligated to do so. Um, is the whole notion and discussion around purposeful leadership? And I heard you recently talk a little bit about purposeful leadership and how important it is, especially in today's world. It's always important, it was always important, but it's been magnified in today's world with all of the challenges that we have. And, uh, and, and, and people are speaking about it more in line also with the whole trait of empathy and the ability to be able to be very empathetic in the way you go, you, you go about doing your important role as CEO of this huge multinational company. Can you talk a little bit about those things, about purposeful leadership, about empathy, your journey in those things as well? Absolutely. And, you know, I, to, to me, I've, I've never been the most empathetic person in or out of work. I mean, it's just not <laughs> come naturally to me. I think things like life experience, including something like COVID, makes you um, a more empathetic person. It brings out empathy in you, um, you know, and, and so I, I look at it as that COVID has tested all of us. It's still testing us. This is not a 10K. This is a marathon, maybe an ultra marathon, right? And so it's like, how do you want to behave? And in, in, as not only as an individual, but as a company, what do you stand for? What do you want to hold on to and what are you willing to let go? And I, I think a big part of it is that in times of stress and in times of crisis, character is revealed, not just for individuals, but for companies and even for countries. And so in, in, in some element, you know, um, our first feeling, and it, 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 was, uh, it was just like that, easiest decision I ever made was we're putting colleagues first. That's it. We're not going to say it. We're going to do it as opposed to a lot of companies put shareholders first or they put their clients first. There's going to be a period of time in crisis where our colleagues' interests come first. And so, you know, and, and part of that is having more empathy and more humanity in, in how you approach things. So one of, one of the things that we did as an organization was I recognized and I said to our shareholders. Um, this is not a matter of survival for Marshall McLennan. We will survive. We will be profitable in 2020. We may not make as much profit as we expected to, but it, it, it's not a question of whether we can make it or not. We're going to make it. So we're, we're going to make sure that our employees know that as long as we were in the thick of the pandemic, as long as there was a health prices that their jobs were secure and that's what we said we were going to do and that's what we did and so you know now that doesn't last forever that that basically is like okay once the health crisis abates and then it's the economic crisis then you've got to revert to some element of business as usual but I think for a lot of our colleagues it was uh, affirming I had I received so many notes from around the world of how much easier they were able to sleep or they were able to think and they had all kinds of stories about how their spouse lost a job or how they were supporting their extended family because they were the only one who had that secure employment and things like that. And so, so that, that, that was really good. And I, you know, I think for, um, we, we've talked about it before, Julio, that a lot of big companies are overmanaged and underled. This was a time for big companies Marshall McLennan and others to, to actually practice leadership over management. And leadership, you know, to me um, is, is, is more about, you know, having some level of not what we are, but what do we want to be? What do we aspire to be? What's the possibility we can be? What's our best nature? And I, I do think that COVID was a way for some of that to come out for Marshall McLennan. Yeah, to, uh, terrifically said and positioned. Um, I think leadership really matters, especially during these times. And it is about leadership, not about management. Management is about executing leadership desires during a, during a difficult time. 
but leadership is about setting the path and making sure that it's a clear path for everybody to want to join and feel part of. And that's, especially during these times, employees, colleagues need to be feeling part of something that is somewhat um, gives them some path uh, you know, forward. And I think that leadership, good leadership recognizes that and, and, and rallies around a strong purpose and being very empathetic during these times. By the way, I, I tend to disagree with you about your your penchant for empathy. I, I've seen empathy flow from you in many ways, but maybe you leave you let your guard down with me and maybe not with others. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. But anyway, I want to get to some questions. There's some really good questions here. And one of them is one that is asked often um, during times like these. And it's an appropriate question to ask again, although you may have addressed it in some of your comments already, but what are the issues that are so relevant to you and top of mind that perhaps keeps you a bit awake at night as you toss and turn and think those through? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think ultimately I'll start with uh, health and safety, you know, because ultimately I want people to come back to the office. I'm, I'm coming into the office generally a couple of times a week. Uh, I'd like other people to dip their toe in the water, but it scares the hell out of me. Like, I, I'm not a health expert. I really don't know. I don't want people to be put at risk. I want it to be an individual decision as opposed to a company decision or a company mandate. But I look at my great city of New York City, uh, that city needs people to come back to work. You know, it doesn't work unless people come back. And yet, so that, that's one of those things that I talk and turn over because I read all the information. I read all the stuff. And, and ultimately, you know, as I'm doing that reading, I'm recognizing that uh, we may only be halfway through. And on that basis, and we may be entering a, a darker period uh, with the flu season and with cold weather and people being indoors more. But I certainly don't want to dramatically encourage people to come back right at the time where risk seems to be rising. And so, you know, and I don't know, and this, I don't know the answer to that, Julio, but I, but I do recognize that our great cities, whether you're talking about New York, London, Chicago, Paris, it, the system doesn't work with having empty infrastructure and, and declining taxes. Um, and so how do we, how do we learn to live with the crisis more? Not that we've ever eradicated, that we ever feel so super comfortable, but that we, we, we learn to carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the relevance of really trying to understand the health implications of our employees is much more acute today than it ever has been. I mean, there's always been a desire for you, other leaders, to of course secure a healthy work environment, you know, for our employees, of course, and in some ways provide, you know, benefits that allows them to have healthy living outside of work as well. And the connection between those two, vitally important. But now it's so acute. I mean, it's so top of mind. And in many cases and in many ways can really be a life death decision in some cases, right? Because some of our employees, if themselves are not compromised in one way, may have family members that are compromised in right. one way or another. So the tentacles uh, really go a lot further in terms of the implications if in fact we quote unquote get it wrong and there is no right answer. So it's a very difficult situation we find ourselves in. Uh, that's right. That, that's why for us, um, we're gonna rely on personal judgment because nobody knows their circumstances better than that person. And so we're, right. we're going to create a healthy environment. I mean, geez, when I go to my office, yeah, I don't think there's been a, I've ever felt I've been in a cleaner place on, on the planet. They must clean that thing. <laughs> but, 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 but ultimately I, I, I completely uh, get it that everybody's situation is different. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I don't think companies should challenge somebody about their personal circumstances. You know, right. so right. there's people who who are as healthy as a horse, but you don't know what their family members are like, or you don't know if they're caregiving to an elderly parent. I mean, and, and you shouldn't. It's not your business. 
as a company. And so, right. uh, so, so that, that's one of the things I, I like getting to answers. And this is one that it do, doesn't have a, a real answer. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's another question in here that uh, I think uh, that people would benefit from uh, your answer. Um, the, the, uh, the question is how do you see the future of the role and topics of board committees, which are the uh, which are the emerging scopes and topics that forward-looking boards are getting more involved with? Yeah, well, I mean ESG, I, and I would say ESG and R, right? So I would add resilience to that as well. Mm -hmm. Boards have to dig in, and this is not, you know. Uh, corporate social responsibility. This is ESG across a wide spectrum, which includes everything ar ar around sustainability and impact on environment, but, but clearly also in, uh, in, in includes things like DNI and not just DNI in terms of raw stat, getting like boards do get underneath the issues uh, <laughs> to understand hiring rates, uh, you know. Uh, involuntary and voluntary levers and promotion opportunities and, you know, how, uh, what, what's happening at the resource group level. Um, so I, I do think ESG more than anything else. And I do think that you're going to see a lot more reporting on ESG kind of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are not going to be pretty, you know, but, but you got to start somewhere. And I think transparent levels of, of reporting uh, which I'm now challenging the team to figure out, okay, what should we do? Because I, I really want us to be in the vanguard of it. And even though the numbers won't be pretty, it won't be something to be proud of, uh, well, we should do it anyway and, and make sure that, that we publicly um, put some of our human capital statistics out there. Uh, you know, so I, I do think that's a big one. I think boards, frankly, uh, many of them uh, are overweighted to systems and governance, systems and controls, uh, as opposed to um, growth strategy. And so I, I do think so. There's, there's a balance. I mean, that, that you, you go through directors and governance and comp and audit and um, you know, the ESG committees and finance of uh, the executive committee. I mean, that's a day in and of itself. Right to do that well, and so you know, ultimately, it's a, it's a big effort, lots of work. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think the effort of of committees are actually going to grow because there's just so many issues. You got to do it at a committee level. You don't have the you don't have the time to be able to do it at the full board. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I mentioned the dreamers before, and, and, and I think particularly for, for this audience, I think there's more that companies can do to impact. Now, obviously, you live in a democracy, we get to vote. So number one, you know, companies need to give people time off so they can go vote and they need to encourage them to vote. Uh, but, but, but ultimately, I think in particular, uh, what I was mentioning before, a lot of dreamers are actually the people working. When, when, when a lot of folks were highest, hiding underneath their bed, you know, you, you want to talk about tragedy. What, what would have happened if people stopped showing up for work and there was no food supply and the pharmacy was unstopped? I mean, you know, at, at the end. And so I, I, I hope that corporate America can take more of an active uh, position to say, you know, Let's, let's recognize how the company uh, and the country was supported by our dreamers. Great way to end our session, which sadly has to come to an end. I can't believe I just looked at the clock and it's two o'clock. Um, I really feel like- oh, let's, let's let everyone get off the call and we can continue. <laughs> it's just like, all time, just like always, right? No different. Uh, but Dan, I can't, I can't say enough about uh, how um, importantly it was for you to come on and speak to this uh, important group and give a perspective that I think is very helpful in today's times as we plan for managing the current situation 
and positioning ourselves for success into the future, whether it's personal success or corporate success. And certainly in the eyes of somebody who's had the experience that you've had, and uh, of course, with the interactions with the board, especially with uh, our attendance today, I really do appreciate the time and uh, I couldn't be more proud of you, my friend. No, th thank you, Julio. Thank you, Esther. Completely my pleasure and, and uh, um, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Um, I'm also uh, a couple of administrative reminders. Uh, I want to first, of course, thank everybody for tuning in today. Remind you to fill out your feedback forms, please. Uh, they will be emailed uh, to you after the session. And I, of course, want to thank uh, Esther and this great organization for hosting this event. I want to turn it over to her for some last words. So thanks again, everyone. Well, no, thank you. And uh, Dan, really, our appreciation to both of you. Um, just a reminder, we have our series with CEOs. We kicked it off with Dan. Dan, thank you for helping us kick off our Leadership Matters series. Our next CEOs are going to be the, the CEO of Kaiser Permanente and the CEO and chairman, um, Cesar Conde, of, of uh, NBC Universal, um, and more to come. So what a great way to kick off this series. Thank you again, Dan, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, no, thank you. Bye. Bye.